I'm excited to be here. Uh, you have to forgive my Mississippi State tie. I packed it in good faith yesterday. Mm. I, t <laughs> I told my pastor back in West Memphis before I left, I said, you know, just pray for the Bulldogs. I said, because it's for the people, because the anointing will be so much stronger after a win. It's, it's, it's about the Lord. You know, it's all about Him. And God answered our prayers. So uh, we're excited about that. I'm excited to be back home. It has been too long. And uh, a lot of really neat things happen here. And that's what I want to preach about. I'm, I want to get down to the end because we've already sang the sermon. So thanks for that. Now I feel like I have to sing it for it to be as good. But we already sang the sermon. I'm ready to get to the altar call. But I feel like God has a journey for us today. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for having me come and speak. It uh, means a lot to me to let me be up here and for my wife, Courtney, to stay with me, to put up with me and to, to come down here. And my little boy, who will probably become part of the show before this whole service is over with. He doesn't like to be in the background. But... God is good, and I'm ready to just, I'm ready to get into it, because this church has meant so much to me because of what, what God's done here in this place, and I believe he's wanting to move us on towards the future, and I, just, I stand f feeling like I'm speaking the words that Samuel did in our text today in 1 Samuel chapter 7. He said, thus far has the Lord helped us, and that's what I want to preach on today. Thus far has the Lord helped us, so let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much that, Lord, we have a place here where we can come and worship you together. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to live for you, to have life in you. We thank you for the freedom and the salvation and everything that we have from you. God, everything in this world comes from you, and we all return it all back to you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that the message I share today is from your heart, God, and I believe it's for every person here. I thank you for the challenge you put in my heart through the preparation, and I pray that, Lord, today we will move forward into the life you have for us, Lord inspired by the way that you have been faithful in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to share out of 1 Samuel chapter 7, if you want to turn there with me. And thank you for the tall pulpit. I live in a world of smaller people. And this is, this is nice. I told my wife, I said, one day we're going to build a house and all the sinks are going to be above here. Because uh, this is, you know, shower heads are not supposed to be right here. But, so this is nice. I can stand up straight. But, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, I want to give a little bit of background because the ark of God, which was a symbol, and it was the presence of God, had been taken in battle. The, uh, the priests, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed in battle, and uh, the Israelites were defeated. And a messenger came back to tell the high priest, Eli, he was an old man sitting there at the gate, and they came in and said, your sons have been killed in battle. The ark has been taken back by the Philistines. We have been routed and in grief, he fell backwards, and he fell, and he died. Things are not looking good, okay? And then they take the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines do, the enemies of, the, of Israel, take it back to their town, set it up in their temple like a trophy, and their god, Dagon, falls down on his face in the middle of the night, this big statue, falls down on his face. So they prop him back up. There's a whole sermon there, propping your old gods back up, but they prop their god back up, because he can't stand up on his own. And then the next night, boom, he's laid down on his face. They prop him back up. The next morning, boom, he's down on his face. His head and hands fell off. And then the whole town gets infested with tumors. You can read a little bit more about those tumors. These are very unpleasant tumors. But God was, was saying, my presence does not belong here. And so they were so ready to get it out of town. They packed some gold up. They put the Ark of God on a cart. They sent it off on some cows, and they basically slapped the cows and said, go back to Israel. We don't want you in our place anymore. So they go back. The Israelites are so excited. They, they take the cows, and they sacrifice them. They burn them on the broken pieces of cart that they had, and they were just celebrating what God had done. It was, a, a, it was an exciting time. And this is where we're picking up in chapter 7. Because the Israelites had all this happen because they were in sin. They had been rebelling against God. The Hophni and Phinehas were doing detestable things in the temple. It was just a bad time. They had turned their backs on the Lord. And so whenever God brought the ark back like that, they were celebrating. And they decided that they wanted to come together and consecrate themselves to the Lord again. So if we'll turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 5, we pick up here. Then Samuel told them, Gather all of Israel to Mizpah. And I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah, and in great ceremony drew water from a well and poured it out before the Lord. 
They also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. It was at Mizpah that Samuel became Israel's judge. Man, the Israelites, like I said, fresh off a long period of idolatry, fresh off a long period of sin, turning their backs on God. But now they have this opportunity that they're saying, I want to consecrate myself to the Lord again. God has brought this victory. We have been in sin. We want to give our lives to you, Lord. And I don't know about you, but like my dad said earlier, many of us have had a consecration at these altars in this place. Have you had a moment where you said, Lord, here's my life? How many of you guys, you've had a moment like that in these very altars? I don't know how many times I got saved in these altars. There's no telling. <laughs> Probably one, I need to do one more time. But this altar was a place where I consecrated my life to the Lord. A place where I said, I have been lost in idolatry. I've been worshiping me. That's really what it all comes down to, right? Sin is just worshiping yourself. I want it, so I take it. God says no, I say yes. Sounds sort of like my three-year-old. God's going to save him. I believe it. I'm praying up. No, he's good. He's just three. But Lord is going to save him. I believe it. We pray every night too. It's so funny. Not funny. It's really cute and wonderful. But at night we'll pray, and then he'll want to sing, and he wants to sing Amazing Grace, and he'll sing with me all four verses. It's wonderful. He's an awesome little boy right after he was just a total rebel. God's going to get him. But we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, and we say, you know what? I've been living for myself. I've been living in idolatry. I don't want to live for myself. I don't want to live in sin. I'm consecrating myself to you, Lord. I'm giving myself to you, Lord. That's where Israel was on this day, and what a wonderful time that is. But tell me if this is how it works. You come, you consecrate yourself to the Lord, you lay down your sin, you lay down your old life, and then you walk away, and everything's better. Nothing ever happens again, right? Right? You go home and there's no consequences for your past actions? Is that how it works? You go home and the devil's like, well, I guess I lost that one. Well, better luck next time. How many of you guys know it's the complete opposite? You come down and you consecrate yourself to the Lord. You cry the tears all over the altar. You lay it down. You lay it down and you start to pick it back up and you lay it down again. (laughs) You're wrestling with God in the altar. And then you see if you feel like you got this victory and you walk out and that victory gets challenged immediately, does it not? Immediately the enemy is going to challenge you. Whenever I pray with students in the altar and they give their hearts to the Lord, praise God happens almost every week. Sometimes it's the same ones, but hey, one of those times it's going to catch, you know? But we pray and I was like, when you walk out of this building, I guarantee you this will be the most tempting, difficult night of your life. You're going to go home and everything you laid on that altar is going to be forced back on your mind. The enemy's going to say, nothing happened in that altar. You're going to have all those things happen. Something terrible might happen. And you have no idea what's going to happen in your life, but what happened in the altar was real. So know that and expect what's going to happen when you walk out of here. And that's exactly what happened with the Israelites. If we'll continue on, they had this consecration there at Mizpah, and immediately they faced opposition. It says in verse 7, when the Philistine rulers heard that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, They mobilized their army and advanced. The Israelites were badly frightened when they learned the Philistines were approaching. Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and offered it to the Lord as a whole burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel, and the Lord helped them. The enemy knows when we're susceptible, when we're weak. He sees that. And when we come to the altar and we break down all our walls... And we lay it down and we allow ourselves to just be bare before the Lord, like the Israelites were doing at that place. They were not there armed for battle. They were there to bow their knees and to consecrate themselves to the Lord. And the enemy saw their susceptibility and said, they're weak, they're fasting, they're not expecting it. Now we're going to come and attack. And they came to attack, but the Israelites did something different this time. Rather than jumping up and grabbing their swords, what did they do? They cried out to the Lord they had just consecrated their lives to. Because the opposition came, but the way they faced the opposition was different. All of a sudden, the terms of battle have changed at this point. And they said, please do not stop pleading with the Lord that he will intervene here. When we've consecrated ourselves to the Lord, we do battle a different way than we used to. When we walk out and those temptations come against us, we can face that temptation and know that the Bible says 
that no temptation can come upon us that's beyond what we can bear, but God will always provide a way out if we will take it. We're not going to consecrate ourselves to the Lord and walk out and never have fear. But when fear comes, we can know that the Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, of self-control. We fight our battles differently. We don't walk out and say, I'm just going to be stronger. Ever tried that one? I just haven't tried hard enough before. If I try harder this time, I'm going to win this battle against temptation. Tell me how that one turns out. Maybe I'm just never going to overcome. We start sounding like Eeyore. I'm never. <laughs> then we go through this process our whole life, then it's back to the altar. Just walk back out, fall into defeat. At some point, we've got to start fighting different. At some point, we've got to say, I've consecrated myself to the Lord, and this opposition confirms that God has done something in my life. Instead of it being a fearful thing, we say, wow, I must have really had some victory in the Lord. And if God gave me victory then, he's going to give me victory now. Please, Lord, intervene in this situation. I need you. This, this temptation is too great for me, but I don't fight my own battles. You say my, that I fight with weapons that are mighty through prayer for the tearing down of strongholds and darkness. That's what I'm praying for. God, I need you to fight my battle. I need for you to intervene. You give your heart to the Lord. And you're going to go home to the same struggle within your marriage, but you face that differently. Because you're not trying to overcome in your own strength. You're asking the Lord to give you victory, to give you wisdom, to give you self-control, maybe. <laughs> Amen? Anybody else? We may go home to the same health crisis, but we don't face that health crisis the same way. Amen? Amen? We may go home to the same demons from our past, but we don't face those demons the same way, do we? Because we're not overcoming the devil on our own. No. We're coming with the power of the Holy Spirit because greater is he that's in us than he that's within this world. We fight a different battle, and we fight it a different way. As a church, we've consecrated ourselves to the Lord. Now are we just going to cower in defeat? Are we going to try to fight our own battles against the enemy? No, we're going to call on the name of the Lord that we've just consecrated ourselves to. And we pray for divine intervention. We've consecrated our lives to the Lord. We're facing this opposition. Now we're saying, Lord, intervene. We need intervention in our lives. So just as Samuel was sacrificing this burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day, and the Philistines were thrown into such confusion that the Israelites defeated them. The men of Israel chased them from Mizpah to a place below Beth Car, slaughtering them all along the way, just like Mississippi State did to Auburn. Amen. Was that in the Bible? I'm sorry. Sometimes you sort of insert your own stuff in the Bible. Sorry about that one. Oh, sorry. Slaughtering them along the way. It would seem like a poor military tactic. The enemy has gathered. It's time to take up arms. Let's draw up the maps. Let's figure out how we're going to counter. How are we going to flank? What are we going to do? But instead, they fall on their knees and they cry out to God. They're fighting in a different way. And God sees this. He's like, this isn't just another time. He said, oh, God, you know, you know when Hophni and Phinehas were killed and that whole thing happened? They had been living for themselves, living in sin, living in idolatry. Then they thought, oh, we're going to the battle. Let's just walk the Ark of the Covenant out in front, and then God will give us victory. No consecration, not truly living for the Lord, just wanting him to give them blessings. There's a sermon again. Not really wanting to consecrate yourself to the Lord, just wanting all the goodies. So they walk the Ark of the Covenant out in front of the armies. They get routed because God says, my pleasure's not here. Well, here is a different story consecrate themselves to the Lord, fall on their knees, make the sacrifice, and then say, God, we need you to intervene. God sees their heart. He intervenes in a way that we can never do. And then empowered by God, they look up and they see the victory has already been won, and they pursue the enemy, and they're kicking their rear ends all the way down the road. I'm like, oh, we're going we're to beat you right here in our backyard. We're going to beat you around the corner. We're going to beat you at your mama's house. We're going to beat you at your daddy's house. We're going to beat you to grandmama's house. We're going all the way down the family line. God's given us victory over the enemy. Amen? And it comes through the consecration to the Lord. It comes through that. We're fighting the same battle, but we're fighting it a different way. 
When we call on the Lord in our struggle against the enemy, he intervenes. Our war is not with flesh and blood, with authorities and rulers and powers against dark forces of evil in the heavenly places. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through prayer for the tearing down of strongholds. That's why we know the word. If we think knowing the word is all about having something we can check off on a list so we can say we, we've achieved certain levels of spirituality because we have, no. It's because the weapons of our warfare are mighty through prayer. And if we don't have a weapon, it sure can't be mighty. We need the word. Southside has been a place of the tearing down of strongholds. Growing up here, I've seen people pray through addictions and fight through addictions. It doesn't always happen like that fight through addictions and have their lives changed completely. People walk in here that you think there's no hope for that person, and years later, they're a part of seeing the lives transformed by the tens and the twenties and the hundreds. God changing lives, strongholds being torn down, divine intervention. And I've seen it happen, I believe, because of the dedication to prayer. That's one of the things I took away from growing up here. We used to have Saturday night prayer every Saturday night. And I remember in junior high, high school, Saturday night, I did not really want to go to prayer. I don't know many, you know, teenagers are just like, you know, what do you want to do Saturday night? I just want to pray. But we came. And I remember, you know, walking, you know, an hour is a long time for someone who's 14. Let me just say it's long for a person who's, how old am I? 29, not 30 yet. An hour is still a long time. When I preach for an hour, you're going to think this was a long time. That was a joke. I'm not preaching an hour. Don't worry. So I would walk. I would walk from this corner in the back, and I would walk touching the back of the pews all the way to that corner, and all the way to that corner, and all the way to that corner, and all the way, just touching the pews and praying. And then I'd get done walking the whole sanctuary and think it's got to be at least 50 minutes that I've been walking 10 minutes, Lord Jesus, <laughs> intervene. So I'd start in that corner, and I'd walk to that corner. I'd go up to the balcony. I got to, I got to walk. Or I'm going to sit there thinking about, oh, Lord, I just pray. I think, oh, look, the birds are, I like birds. Birds are cool. I like to eat chicken. I, like, I love chicken. My brain starts going. You guys have prayers like that? <laughs> I got to keep moving. Gotta, got, but I remember Saturday after Saturday after Saturday hearing people crying out for God crying out for God's presence to be here. We celebrate the presence of God in this place. That doesn't just happen, you know? Nothing just happens like that. People pray. Things happen when we pray like that. Midweek, coming up here during the summers to work in the church, one of the perks of being the pastor's kid is there's always work to do. I guess that's a perk. I don't know. Walking in the church today, I was looking around Wilson Hall, and I was like, yeah, I dug that trench. I dug that trench. I dug that trench. I moved that pile of dirt. Like it was never really great jobs, but I sweated a lot here. But on, on those mornings that the ladies would gather in here to pray, come walking in the office, desperate for some water because it's like 600 degrees outside, and just hear women crying out to God, pleading for God to save their loved ones, pleading for God to transform people's lives, pleading for the presence of the Lord to be in this place. That's why these things happen. That's why. Praying for divine intervention. Praying for God to step in when there is no other way. That's how God loves to work. Jesus said, when there was no way, I became the way. And there are situations in your life, there seems to be no way. We serve a, a Savior who says, where there seems to be no way, I am the way. I am the way. They consecrated themselves to the Lord. They face this opposition. They're praying for divine intervention. And then they declare the word of the Lord here. And Samuel, this is our key text today. Samuel took a large stone, placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshana. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, thus far, the Lord has helped us. I didn't get too excited like I thought it would. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. What are we celebrating today? Thus far, the Lord has helped us, amen? Yes, he has. If we think that this church is what's changed our life, God forbid. Thus far, he has helped us. 
if we think thus far the pastors of this church has helped us, God help us. I love my dad, but God help us. Thus far, he has helped us. He's used people, yes. But if we ever think it's somebody, when that somebody's taken away, our world's going to crumble. When that somebody who is a human being somehow fails us in some way, doesn't call when we think they should call, doesn't show up when we think they should show up, doesn't say what we think they should say, or we're crushed. Our faith is not in a person. Our faith is in the God, and thus far, he has helped us. Amen? Now, oftentimes, the Israelites would put these pile of rocks around, which I'm just thinking, I want to go over there to Israel in that area and see. There's got to be rocks everywhere. So if they walk through something, they're like, oh, thank you, God, let's build a pile of rocks. And then they walk through the, the Red Sea, and they're going to build a pile of rocks. They walk across the, the Jordan River. They walk through on dry ground. They're going to build a pile of rocks, and they're going to say, this is going to commemorate what God did on this day. So that from generation to generation to generation to generation, people are going to see these rocks, and they're going to praise God for what he did. Whew. This was not the first pile of rocks around Israel The Samuel slapped down on the ground out there. He gets this rock, and he says, this rock is called Ebenezer, the rock of help, because thus far God has helped us. Man, this stone will declare from generation to generation to generation. But we're not just supposed to celebrate what happened in the past. Many times the Israelites, when they get lost in idolatry, they would forget that God's a God of the future, that God's a God of the present, and they just celebrate what God did before. Even there was a time that, that a uh, plague of, of vipers came against the Israelites because of their sin and grumbling against God. The vipers were biting people. People were dying by the thousands. They're panicked. God says, fashion this serpent and put it on a staff made out of gold and stick it out there. And if people gaze on the serpent, then they'll be healed. When that serpent is raised up and people gaze upon it, they'll be healed and the, the plague will stop. Awesome, right? Why wouldn't you keep that staff and that serpent? What a celebration of what God has done. Want to know what happens years and years pass? They hold the staff up and everybody... They're bowed down and worshiping a stick with a snake on it. Like the stick did something. The stick didn't do anything. It's a stick. They made a snake and slapped it on there. God is the one who saved them. So far be it from us to look at an, a, an experience or to look at a person or to look at a place and think, that place saved me. No, 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 no. That is the place that God saved me. And it didn't just stop then. Thus far, God has been faithful. Thus far sort of hints that there's more to come. It wasn't like, this is the end, and God has helped us. Praise God, now let's all just die and go to heaven. It was thus far, God has been faithful. So, next step, God will be faithful. 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 Thus far, God has helped me. Thus far, God has helped me. Thus far, God has helped me. That's what life is in the Lord. It's never you hit a peak and boom, you know, the lightning flashes and there's thunder and everything is like, oh, yes, God, is, it's victory, and now I'm just going to walk the rest of my life. Just, oh. Plus blessings. I had a moment with the Lord 37 years ago. Yes. It's been victory ever since. Sometimes it's thus far you've helped me. Thus far you've helped me. Thus far you've helped me. This looks overwhelming, God. I don't know how I'm going to face this, but I, would, I just walked by that spot, and I remember what you did here. Thus far have you helped me. Sort of sounds like when David hears this Philistine giant out there cursing God's name. No one else wants to go out there and fight him. David, little runt boy of the family, walks up and says, how are we going to let this guy defy the name of our God? I'm going to fight him. I'm going to fight him with what I fought, the lion. Because God's spirit came on me and I overcame the lion. God's spirit came on me, I overcame the bear. Thus far has God been faithful. Thus far has God been faithful. Who's this Philistine? I'm going to deliver him to the birds. Thus far have God been faithful. Thus far have you helped us. Thus far have you helped us. There is a city in need, and thus far God has helped us. Who are we to say he's not going to help us again? He is going to help us again. I have moments like that from this building. 
If I just tried to stay inside of this building, if I start doing the whole campus, we'd at least be here all day. Like I said, I'm not preaching an hour. I already talked to the children's workers. I understand. I feel their hurt. <laughs> but I remember our first New Year's service when we moved here, and the, the platform used to just stop about right here, right? And it was carpet like that. And I was on this corner, and Ms. Tina Smith was praying with me, and I remember praying, God, I want to live for you this year like I've never lived for you in my life. I want to do that this year. And every year on New Year's, I remember that. And I pray, God, this year, I want to live for you more this year than I did last year. Thus far has God been faithful. And there's been a lot of years since then already. But thus far, God has been faithful. Thus far has God been faithful. Thus far has God helped me. So every year, it's God, I want to serve you more this year than I ever did in the past. Because I've got more and more and more pile of rocks around my life to say thus far and thus far and thus far and thus far. What is this challenge? What is this? Look what God has done. Look what God has done. I knew when I came to the altar here growing up, my grandma and my grandpa sat about the third row back over here. My mom sat in the second row. And I knew, especially before I got into youth, that's a whole other story. When I sat over here, I'd come pray right here at this altar. Like I said, it was a little different before. I knew my mamma was going to come cry over me. That's just what mamas do. My papa was going to come cry over me. They're going to be speaking in tongues. Mom's going to come cry and speak in tongues and pray over me. Dad's going to come cry and speak in tongues and pray over me. Some other people in the church are going to come pray and speak in tongues. Those things stick in people's minds. Do it. Do it, do it, do it. Pray over the young people. Pray over the old people. Pray over yourself. We need God. Thus far as God helped us, we need each other. We need him. I remember times with Brother John Hayes praying for me. Brother George Coleman praying for me, the people all throughout this church, when I was coming up and having those moments saying, God, I need you, and to feel the support of people coming around, it wasn't just people touching me. Every person was a pile of rocks. I'm saying, thus far has God helped this person. Thus far has God helped that person. Thus far has God helped that person. Who am I to think that God's not going to help me? I've got the support. I've got these pile of rocks all around me. Thus far has God helped me. I'm going to make it. It was on one of those Saturday night prayer services, walking up in the balcony. I finally found myself laying up in the corner, back around that little walkway up in the top. There's a little short pew up there. I don't know if it's still there. But I was laid on the ground over there, praying. It was my senior year of high school. I wrestled with the call of God because growing up in a pastor's home, I recognized that if you're not called to be a minister, you better not be one. Some people have a misconception that being a minister is a really easy thing, but they don't understand the depth that goes on inside your mind and your heart and the attack that the enemy brings against you. And if you're doing it because you want to, that's not going to last very long. And I, I wrestled with it, and I, I, I'd already applied to go to Mississippi College. I was going to study history and teach history and be a coach. I wanted to serve God. It wasn't like I was running from God. I, just, I wasn't sure about this whole call of God that I received at eight years old. It's kind of, I started doubting, right? Did you ever doubt anything before? I'm thinking, I was eight years old. I wasn't even a teenager, and I felt called to minister to teenagers. Come on. I, don't know, I just don't know about that. All right, we'll see. Maybe God will get a hold of me. Laying up there on the ground, God got a hold of me again. He started a process. I had a moment up there that I always remember. In my mind, it's like he took me inside of this warehouse, and I was living in the warehouse, and it was a church. I was living in my office, sweeping the floors at night and ministering, making no money. And he said, would you do this for me? I remember saying, Yes. If that's what you want me to do, then I'll do it. Because if I'm going to go in the ministry, I'm going to go in, all in, right? Not like, well, if you provide for me, if you give me what I want, you know, if you meet all my conditions, then I'll serve you. That's a whole other sermon in itself again. I need to get on a series here, people. But we can't come conditionally. And it took me getting to that point up there to where I could pile up a pile of rocks. And whenever hardships come my way, I say, I didn't say I was going to serve God because it was easy. I said I was going to serve God because God said to serve me. I was going to serve God in ministry because he said to serve him in ministry. I have a pile of rocks up in that corner that I'll always remember. It's my Ebenezer. It's my Ebenezer here. I, I'm surprised it's not waterlogged right here about on this corner. This is my Ebenezer right here. This was my corner. We sat in youth. I sat on like the second or third row right over here. And I, every service, laying my head down on that, unless somebody beat me to this corner, then I got bitter and I went back to my seat. That's my corner. It was an Ebenezer for me. Still remember it. It didn't stop then. 
I still remember those moments. Again, like I said, my senior year, I won't share the whole story, lots of moments that God reconfirmed his call in my life. But before I left for college, I wanted to be rebaptized. So I got baptized at, I don't know, six, seven years old, really young. And I mean, I sort of understood what it meant, but I also just wanted to swim in church. <laughs> Let's be honest. Some of you still do in your 50s, but I wanted to be rebaptized because my whole life I'd heard this quote of this huge percentage of people who leave their faith when they graduate high school. Somewhere between everywhere, I've heard everything from 70 to 85 percent of students when they graduate high school within the first year, they've abandoned the faith that they grew up in. I thought, I do not want to be a statistic. I will not be that statistic. I will not. Thus far has God helped me. Who am I to turn my back on him now? I wanted to be rebaptized. My dad rebaptized me. I just, I committed myself to that. I said, I will not be one of those who walks out of this building and walks away from my faith. And that meant more to me. I stepped out and the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and I grabbed the first person available. Brother Frank Delansky was standing up there in the corner and in that little cubby hole, he grabbed a hold of me and he cried like he was the one who just got baptized. And we wept and cried and cried and wept. And, and it was just one of those moments God said, this is an Ebenezer, do not forget this. You're going to need to remember this. Hold on to it. Do you guys have those moments? Do you have those piles of rocks in your life? These are Ebenezer's to us. Thus far have you been faithful. Thus far have you helped me. Wow. What we have to be cautious about is to always catch ourselves looking back. When we've had these moments with the Lord, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, we find ourselves just remembering what God's done and forgetting the implication of thus far has God been faithful. Up to this point is what another translation says. Up to this point has God been faithful. That means there's still more work to be done. There's still more to be done. When I think of this church, we could sit here and say 54 years God has helped us. We can celebrate that. Our city is still dying and in need of salvation. Thus far has God been faithful? Thus far has he helped us? Yes. Years and years and years of sowing seed into housing complexes, into apartment places, into ch children's lives, into individuals' lives that are, so, that, are, that are reaping a harvest that we will never, ever have a grasp of until we're in heaven. But we're not done yet. Thus far has he helped us? So how much greater is he going to help us? My dad mentioned the people of this church helped to raise me. You sowed seeds into my life. And I recognize that anything that I ever do in my life is not something I've accomplished because of my own efforts. It's because of seeds sown into me by other people that were given to them by the Lord that was sown from other people, from other people. And we have no idea what God's doing out of that. Just multiplying and multiplying. We're not done yet. We aren't done yet. Let's pick up here because there's a job of restoration. So picking up the very next verse in verse 13 of 1 Samuel 7. So the Philistines were subdued and didn't invade Israel again for some time. And throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised up against the Philistines. The Israelite villages near Ekron and Gath that the Philistines had captured were restored to Israel along with the rest of the territory that the Philistines had taken. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites in those days. God began not just to whoop the Philistines that day. He said, oh, you know that town you took from my people? The promise to my people? Yeah, I'm going to take that back. You know this other thing that you stole from my people? Yeah, I'm going to take that back. You know this land that I promised to my people that you, could, you came in and you captured and you enslaved them? Yeah, I'm going to take that back. And we look at our loved ones. You say, oh, you know that loved one that you took away from me, enemy? And you sowed seeds of discord inside their life. And you, you, you did things to them to make them lose their faith in God. Yeah, we're going to take that back. We're going to take that back. Oh, you know our city? Yeah, we're going to take that back. Because thus far have you helped us. Who are we to say we cannot continue? Who are we to say we cannot continue? Thus far has he helped us, and he is not done. We have a rich history here, and I'm proud to be a part of it. I wish I could be here more, but 
Thus far as he helped us, and there's work that God's called me to do. Seeds being sown clear across another state coming from here. I just want to let you know there's students coming out of the ministry that God's given us going all over the world. We've had students every year called in the ministry, going to Bible college. There's a student right now in Bible college who ministers to people over the internet. He's learned, I don't even know what language, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Arabic. He's learning these languages in high school, okay? He learns these languages. Most kids, you know, playing video games, he's learning Arabic. He just led a young man in, in Iran to the Lord over the internet. Doing, the guy just wants to learn English. He starts talking to Damari, and Damari is teaching him English. And without fail, he says, without fail, when they, t- they say, you're an American, tell me about this Jesus. Because we're not allowed to hear about him. Led this man to the Lord. Seeds are being cast out, folks. The job has only begun. Thus far has God helped us, and he's going to continue and continue and continue if we continue in the faith. We can't be stuck in the rearview mirror. God's still in the business of restoring what the enemy has stolen. There are lives in need of restoration. There's a city in need of restoration. There's a nation and a world in need of restoration from the Lord. And we can stand on the rocks, these Ebenezers of our life. We can stand on the Ebenezer of Southside and say, I know what God has done, and I know what God can do. Thus far the Lord has helped us, and we march on in faith, knowing he will help us again. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and thank you so much. God, we cannot even begin to put words to what you've done in our lives, because we know that all of us, all of us were idolaters. All of us were in sin. All of us were in need of salvation without exception. Yet you showed us love and that you came and died for us while we were in our sins. When there was no way, you made the way. God, we thank you and we consecrate our lives to you. And Lord, when we face these oppositions, we're fighting a different fight. Because we're fighting in your name. We're praying for your intervention, Lord. We're declaring over our lives that thus far have you helped us. And we're committing ourselves to the job of restoration in this world. Because until we breathe our last breath and we celebrate in heaven with you, thus far have you helped us and we continue on. We love you and thank you, Jesus. We know that everything that has happened is because of you. Everything that's happening is because of you. And everything that will happen is because of you, Lord. We give you ourselves. We give you this church, Lord. In your name, amen. I'm Lori. Thanks for joining us. Here at Southside, we'd like to help you grow in your relationship with God. For more info and ways to connect, Go to our website. From there, you can like us on Facebook and even subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you need prayer, give us a call at the church office or feel free to email us. May God bless you and we look forward to seeing you soon.